And so there are a lot of things that were going against him. And Paul challenges him and says, but you, man of God. This was a designation that was used in the Old Testament of prophets, people who spoke for God, Moses, Elijah, David. Essentially, Paul is saying the false prophets, who he's talked about before, they think godliness is a means of gain. They preach and teach to make, to make money. It's not about the kingdom of God. It's not about souls. He says, you flee from the love of money. You flee from being like these false prophets. They are men of this world, but you are a man of God. You're possessed by him. You're owned by him. And you speak for him. And so these would be the, this, this, this would be a strong encouragement for Timothy. He was timid and being looked down upon in his church. He was a man of God like the many prophets before him. But as we look at this and we, we look at the fact that he's called man of God, the reality is just as though the false prophets are called men of the world, Scripture actually says that the church has many people that look more like the world than they look like God. Many Christians that look more like the world than they look like God. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, Paul, in speaking to the Corinthian church, says this, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. Mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you still are not ready. You are still worldly, for since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? It's very interesting in talking to the Corinthians, if you remember how bad the church was. Um, chapter 2, they're gathering around different teachers and saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, right? Chapter 5, um, there's a man having sex with his father's wife. Chapter 6, they are suing one another in the church. Chapter um, 14, they're abusing spiritual gifts. Chapter 15, some people were teaching that the resurrection had passed. There was a lot of worldliness in this congregation. Instead of being identified by God's characteristics, they were spiritually immature. If you looked at their lives, sometimes you couldn't tell that they were maybe even Christians. They looked so much like everybody else, right? And so sadly, there are very few men of God or women of God in the church, who when you look at them, they're identified by their godly characteristics. You think of God when you see them. And so what are characteristics of men of God and women of God? How can we develop these characteristics in our own life? Um, Paul here gives four commands, four commands to Timothy, and a motivation to fulfill these commands. As we study them, they should challenge us to allow these to characterize our life in being a man or woman of God. Here's the first one. First characteristic of a man of God or woman of God. The man of God flees from sin. The man of God flees from sin. Look at verse 11. But you, man of God, flee from all this. Again, the context, he talks about how the love of wealth is the root of all types of evil and how the rich, the, uh, the false teachers, were pursuing wealth instead of ministry. He says, but you, you flee all this. That is a characteristic of a man or a woman of God. Now, you might think a man of God or a woman of God is strong. So why would he not say stand firm? Why would he not say stand up and fight? Right? In fact, Scripture, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, talks about how we resist the devil um, how we wrestle with uh, powers and principalities. James 4 talks about how we should resist the devil and he will flee from us. However, when it comes to sin, he says, man of God, woman of God, just run. See, the man of God, the woman of God is wise enough to know that there are some things that he or she must flee from. Like Joseph in Potiphar's household. When Potiphar's wife wants to sleep with him, he just runs and he jumps out the window. In fact, leaves his cloak. He says, this is something I don't want to stay around. I need to run, right? Um, we see this with various different sins in the Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man commits is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 14 says, flee idolatry. 2 Timothy 2, 22 says, flee youthful lust. The man or woman of God is identified by what they flee. In the Greek, this word is fuego. Fuego. We get from this word, we get the word fugitive 
in the English. A fugitive is someone who's running from his potential captor. The man of God knows he can, he can fall to lust. The man or woman of God knows that they're prone to gossip or discord. They're prone to unforgiveness. And so because they don't want to be a captor, because they don't want to go back to that sin they used to walk in, they are constantly fleeing it. In fact, many times, people will look at them like they're strange. How come you don't listen to this type of music? How come you don't watch these type of TV shows? Why? Because I'm vulnerable. Why? Because I know the power of sin in my own life. Why? Because I'm not going back to those addictions. I'm not going back to those strongholds. And so I'm going to pluck out my eye. I'm going to chop off my hand. I'm going to cut off my feet. I'm going to do whatever it takes to not go back. The man of God, the woman of God is known by what she or she, he or she flees. They are holy fugitives. Holy fugitives. Proverbs 22.3 says this. Proverbs 22.3. The prudent sees danger and takes refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. The immature believer just walks into trap after trap after trap where the prudent, the wise, they see the danger and they flee. I'm not going to go be alone with the opposite sex in certain areas. I'm going to be very careful because I'm going to flee, he says. The man of God is known by what he flees. Are you a holy fugitive? Are you fleeing from sin and compromise? Do you know your weaknesses? Here's the next character trait of a man of God or a woman of God. The man of God pursues godly character. The man of God pursues godly character. Verse, verse 11, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. The man of God is not just identified by what he flees, but also by what he's continually running after. The word pursue here um, also can be translated persecute. If someone is, let's say, persecuting Christians, then it's like they're continually trying to trap them, continually trying to accuse them. They just keep going back. In the same way, this is how the man or woman of God is. They just keep going after godly character traits. Um, Pastor Stephen Cole from Flagstaff Arizona, um, talked about how two NFL announcers were talking about a famous um, running back named Wal Walter Payton. And as he describes this, this reflects something about how the man or woman of God pursues godly character. This is what he said. During a Monday night football game, an announcer observed that the Chicago Bears running back, Walter Payton, had accumulated over nine miles in career rushing yardage. The other announcer remarked, yeah, and that's with somebody knocking him down every 4.6 yards. A Christian may get knocked down by sin every few yards, but he gets up and keeps moving towards righteousness. It's his pursuit. Proverbs 24, 16, Proverbs 24, 16 says the righteous man falls down seven times and gets back up. That's what marks the man or woman of God. It's not that you stop sinning. Remember Paul said in Romans 7, the things I would do, I don't do. The things I wouldn't do, I do. 1 Timothy 1.15, he called himself the chief of sinners. But what made him a man of God was that he was someone that even though he got knocked down, and sometimes he didn't just get knocked down, but he got pulled back a couple of yards. That happens in football. Someday they pick you up and just take you back. Sometimes he took a couple of steps back. But what marked him as a man of God is that he wouldn't stay down. Yes, he felt it was lust. Yes, he at times felt it was anger. Yes, at times he had integrity issues. God had to give him a demon in the flesh. He struggled with pride so much, a demon in the flesh that humbled him so he wouldn't be so prideful, right? But even though he fell down and went back, he would not stay down. That's what marks a man or woman of God. We all struggle with sin, but the man or woman of God, someone possessed by him, someone identified by him, someone who speaks for him, they're not going to dwell in it. It's not okay. I'm not going to live here. I'm not going to stay here. I'm not going to wallow in my depression. I'm going to keep going forward. What are these six character traits that we should be pursuing? He says righteousness. Here he's talking about outward character traits such as serving others, such as worshiping God, such as discipling, evangelizing, um, caring for the neglected. These type of character traits should constantly be in the life of a man or woman of God. They desire them. They're pursuing them in their life. 
serving. You'll find them involved in their congregations, using their spiritual gifts in whatever ways possible. They're pursuing righteousness, where many times someone who's spiritually immature has no real desire to serve. They're kind of just comfortable, comfortable on the pew instead of serving. But the man or woman of God is pursuing a righteous life. Godliness. This word, where it can be translated God-likeness, the word has a connotation of reverence for God, worship for God. Whether they're eating or drinking, when they're talking, there's a sense of reverence. You can sometimes even, you get around some people, you can feel their reverence for God on their life. It just covers all their different endeavors. The man or woman of God, that's their desire. Not to glorify the world in their life, but to revere and worship God in everything they do. Faith, it could have two possible meanings. Faith could mean depending on God, right? John 15, 5, Christ says, remain in me, I'll remain in you. Um, apart from your, apart, uh, uh, on your own, you can do no- nothing. Um, so he says, abide in me and you'll produce good fruit. The man or woman of God knows that they cannot do the things that God's called them to do on their own. And so because of that, they are developing faith. Depending on God more, abiding in his word, abiding in prayer, because they know that's where good works and fruit comes from. That's where conquering sin comes from. It's growing in dependence, faith upon God. It could also be translated faithfulness, meaning the man or woman of God, their yes means yes, and their no means no. When they say that they're going to support you or help you, you can trust them. They're a man of God. You know them by their faithfulness. They're people of character, where the immature, many times you feel like you can't rely on them. They're not very faithful, but the man of God, the woman of God, they're faithful. He says love. This in the Greek is the word agape, which was used of God-like love. In our cultures, many times we think of love as being effortless, right? Oh, I was eating dinner, and then I just realized I was in love. Oh, I saw him, and I... I felt, I felt the butterflies, and I knew it was love. I just happened. It was so effortless. We didn't have to work for it, right? That's typically what we think of with love. But that is not biblical love. See, biblical love is an act of the will. It's an act of the will no matter how lovely, no matter how beautiful the other person is, even if they're ugly inside and maybe out. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. It's an act of the will. We choose. Right? That's why scripture can say in Matthew 5, love your enemies. Right? No one in here has ever felt giddy. You never felt butterflies about your enemy. Right? Sometimes I meet Christians and say, well, I just, I I don't want to do this because if I did this, love them or serve them, it would be hypocritical. Right? Because I don't really feel that. And they think that that's kind of noble. Because I don't feel it, I shouldn't do it. And I'm like, no. (laughs) No, that's not true. With my daughter... Um, with my daughter, one day she's going to tell me, I don't feel like doing homework. And I'm going to say, I don't care. (laughs) I'm going to say, do your homework anyway. And the reason I'm going to say that is because part part of maturing is many times learning how to do what you don't feel like doing because it's best, right? I don't feel like going to work. Who cares? Go to work. That's part of maturity. In the same way, part of maturity and growing in God is doing what you're called to do, I don't feel like reading my Bible, so I don't want to do it. And I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like going to church, so I thought it would be best. I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I'm going to lay in the bed. No. Part of spiritual maturity is um, not being led by your emotions, but being led by your faith. It's an act of the will. It's a choice, right? You choose to get up and read your word. You choose to love someone that's unlovable. Love is an act of the will. When I'm discipling um, young married couples and sometimes old married couples and I, you'll hear this, well, we just realized that we, didn't lo- we don't love each other in the, anymore. We don't love each other anymore, and we don't have anything in common. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You're commanded to love your wife as Christ loved the church. It's an act of the will. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a command. It has nothing to do with your emotions, right? If you, if you are led by your emotions and you think love is just about flittering, then you'll probably be someone that's divorced very quickly because sometimes you're not going to feel loving toward your spouse or to your children. It's an act of the will. It's a command. It's something you have to work at to love your enemies. And I said, if you can love your enemies because God commands you, 
certainly you can love your wife. You're commanded to, right? It's an act of the will. You're obeying God. The man of God or the woman of God, instead of being led by their flippant emotion, they're choosing to obey, to love according to God's will, right? He says the other thing that a man of God or woman of God pursues is endurance. The word endurance means to bear up under something heavy. See, the normal response for a child is, one day we're going to put our daughter in, um, I actually took my, my, my took Sai to a jiu-jitsu gym, sin gym, uh, the other day, right? And we went up there, and they're watching all these little kids fight, and I was like, don't you want to do this? <laughs> and she's like, no. <laughs> right? So one day I'll put my daughter in, you know, baseball or basketball or piano or new jiu-jitsu, <laughs> And she's going to say, Daddy, I don't want to do it. And I'm going to say, I don't care. <laughs> and yes, we all have different gifts and we have different talents. And as a child, you want to let them explore various things. But one of the things as a young child is it's natural for them to just want to quit. They go through a hard day. They didn't like it. I want to quit. I don't want to do this. But the reason a good parents keep them going through piano lessons is because it develops something even more important than learning how to play piano. It's called endurance. It's called the ability to bear up under something difficult. And that's something that God wants to develop in your life as well. My wife, she's kind of naturally wired to be a counselor, um, which is kind of difficult when I'm naturally wired to be quiet at times and not go very deep with my emotions and things like that. And so she likes to ask all these probing questions, like into the semester, what has God been teaching you this whole semester? Like, do I really have to think all deeply? And sometimes I'm like, can, can we do this like later, please? <laughs> sometimes. But other times, and I'll be honest with you, I was like, be fully honest, I just think that the main thing God is teaching me, please announce this will be, we'll turn on AC, the building might fill the room. What? Oh, anyways, I don't know. Anyways. Sometimes I'll feel, I'll just say, I feel like God's teaching me perseverance. Um, and that's most semesters at Handong. Just to bear up under something that's difficult and long. And that, we don't, that's not like a redeeming character trait to us. We're not like, I want to learn perseverance. We want to learn love. We want to learn faith. Yes, perseverance, not so much. But many times, that's exactly what God is training us in, right? Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5 says, We rejoice in tribulation, for it produces perseverance. And perseverance develop, uh, produces character. And character, hope, the ability to rely on God, to, to trust in God. We rejoice in our trials because God is enabling me to bear up under a heavy weight. And that's a good thing. That's something that the man of God, the woman of God, should pursue. Instead of the natural reaction being quit, and I'll be honest, how this is how it works in my life, I naturally, I naturally, I go through a, a difficult time and I say, man, maybe it's time to move on. Maybe it's time. I had a, a hard time in the military this summer with some stuff, and I said, maybe it's time for me to get out of the reserves and just kind of focus, right? And when I go through a hard time, that's my natural reaction, but then I have to preach to myself. James 1, 2, we consider it pure joy when we go through trials of various kinds, for it's the testing of our faith. And let perseverance have her perfect work so that you can become mature. And we rejoice when we go through trials because it produces perseverance. That is, it's the AC, not an earthquake. <laughs> not an earthquake, right? Um, that is a work of discipline in my life because I naturally want to quit. I naturally want to give up on something that's difficult. I have to preach to myself, James 1, 2 and verse 3. I have to preach to myself, Romans, uh, Romans 5, 3 through 5. That's something the man or woman of God pursues where the immature, kind of like a child, is kind of prone to quitting. They cut people off. They don't want anything to do with people. They don't persevere. The man or woman of God pursues perseverance. Here's the last character trait the man or woman of God pursues. The man, of, the man or woman of God pursues gentleness. Gentleness is kind of very similar to endurance. Endurance deals with hardship and trials, bearing up under trials. Gentleness has to do with bearing up under difficult people. Instead of res responding with a harsh word or attack or criticizing someone who criticizes you, the man of God is pursuing gentleness. This word was actually used of uh, Alexander the Great's horse in ancient Greek literature. 
Um, it was used of a horse that was previously untamed, meaning if you tried to get on it, it would buck. You couldn't ride it. But all of a sudden, after it had been tamed, you could put the strap on the right side of the neck just gently, and it'd shoot off to the left. So you put it on the, the left side of the neck, and it'd shoot off to the right. <laughs> it was tamed. It was power under control. Sure, you could whoop this person. Sure, you could give them a, a whip lashing with your tongue. But instead, the man of God, a woman of God, takes a deep breath. <sighs> give me grace. God bless you. <laughs> they respond with love. I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. Instead of the whip lashing that would maybe be normal. They're pursuing gentleness when they're dealing with difficult people. Again, this is a work of discipline. It's something you're pursuing. You don't always do it. You don't always love. But even when you fail, you get back up. Yeah, I was, I was harsh, but I'm going to respond with gentleness instead. They just keep getting back up. Yeah, I, wanted, I quit this one, but I, next time I'm just going to persevere. I'm going to endure. The man or woman of God is notified or known, identified, by what they pursue, and they're pursuing godly character traits. Amen? The man of God or the woman of God fights for the faith. The man of God or the woman of God fights for the faith. Verse 12, fight the good fight of the faith. Um, here in the literal, the literal Greek, the, the article is there in the literal Greek. And typically when you have the by faith, it's referring to the doctrines of the faith, the fundamental truths of the faith. This is something that Paul has been dealing with throughout this letter. And Timothy probably was a little timid with this. Chapter 1, I command you to tell those who are teaching false teaching to no longer teach it anymore, right? Chapter 4, in the last days, there will be uh, doctrines of demons and false teachers who teach them. Again, in chapter 6, he talks about those who think godliness is a means of gain, these false teachers. Timothy, I know you don't want to fight this battle. Fighting has to do with pain. I know you don't want to deal with it, but you have to fight this battle. Because when you are not fighting for the fundamental doctrines of the faith, the Holy Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of the inerrancy of Scripture, the doctrine of the substitutionary death of Christ, he died for our sins. When you're not fighting for the faith, people are led astray. The church is robbed of its rich heritage and falls into sin. Timothy, you have to fight this fight. I've been repeating it all throughout this letter. You have to fight for, this, for the faith. The word fight here is an athletic word as well as a military word. Um, literally, it's agonize the good agony. It comes from agon, meaning this pain, this stretching yourself to win the race or to win the battle. Agonize the good agony. Um, John MacArthur comments on the fight for the faith throughout history. He says this, The history of the Christian church consists of repeated battles where the enemy introduces destructive heresies. Those heresies are confronted and the truth is clarified and proclaimed. That is what Paul is doing in 1 Timothy. Many other New Testament letters have the same polemic thrust. The great church councils and creeds, while not carrying scriptural authority, were attempts to correct false teaching and to set forth sound teaching. The Reformation consisted of godly men like Luther and Calvin combating the corruption and false doctrine that had permeated the Roman Catholic Church, setting the forth the great truths of Scripture. Um, Stephen Cole, pastor, said this, Tertullian fought Marcion. He added these, these uh, extra books to the Bible. And Anthonius fought Arians. Augustine fought Pelagius. Luther and Calvin fought the Popes. It is impossible to be a true soldier of Jesus Christ and not fight. But this is not just seen on the macro level, the fundamental doctrines. It's also seen on the personal level and on our ministry to others, right? One of the things you do when you're ministering to those who are depressed is you're listening to see what lies of the devil have they listened to. Maybe it's, I'm not attractive because I don't have this body or I don't have this type of skin. And therefore, they're insecure and they're discouraged. The man or woman of God sees what the lie is and they implant the truth of the word of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-4 says, we take captive every thought and bring it to, in obedience to Christ. They're inserting the truth where they have accepted a lie, right? That's what the man of God does. The man or woman of God, they fight the faith in their own life when they find these lies of the enemy. They are taking these thoughts captive and bringing them in submission to Christ. The man or woman of God is always 
in a fight. They're always in a fight, and it has to do with the, with the faith. Paul says this at the end of his life, right before he dies, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. This is the desire of every man or woman of God, that they would faithfully fight the faith in their own life, in the lives of those around them. They're always in this battle. Here's the last, the last point. The last point is really long. I didn't think I was going to get to it, but I think we will before we have the Lord's Supper. Amen. Oh, no, no, it's not the last point. I got two more. See, I thought I was doing better than I was. All right, here's, here's the fourth one. The man of God takes hold of eternal life. The man of God, the woman of God takes hold of eternal life. Verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Um, what does Paul mean by take hold of eternal life? Does this mean that Timothy's not saved? Of course he's a believer. He's passing the church. What does it mean to take hold of eternal life? Here is the reality. When you look at Scripture, sometimes it deals with eternal life as a future reality. One day we will dwell in heaven. We'll be with God the Father. Right? And we'll have no longer battle sin. But sometimes it talks about eternal life as a present possession. For instance, John 17, 3. John 17, 3. Christ says, this is eternal life, that you may know God. Eternal life is not just something that you receive when you get to heaven. It's something that has been birthed in you when you received the Holy Spirit, when you became a newborn believer. There are aspects in your life, what, with uh, the fruits of the Spirit, etc., that are part of living the life that you're going to live one day in heaven. When Paul says for Timothy to take hold of it, literally this word is to take hold with violence. It was used of Paul when he was in the temple, and the mob came and grabbed him, and they took him. They took him with violence. There is something that the man and woman of God is always taking hold of with violence in their life, and it has to do with their eternal life. In what, in what ways? Christ said, I came that you have may, have, may have peace and not the peace that the world gives. We live in a world where there are constant things to be anxious about, anxious about the future, anxious about the economy, worried about earthquakes. There could be some people probably aren't here today because they heard there was going to be earthquakes. So they went back to Seoul. Right? And so they have all these anxieties when Christ says, I came that you may have peace. And so the man or woman of God takes hold of eternal life by Fighting for the peace that God has promised them, right? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Um, be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer with thanksgiving. Um, through prayer with thanksgiving. Make your request known unto God, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding shall guard your heart and mind. Again, this is something you may not have, but you're fighting for it. You're living in prayer. You're living in thanksgiving. Why? Because you want to have peace. You find that you're down and you're low. There are many things in life that make us depressed and discouraged. But Scripture commands us, Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Regardless of your situation, your circumstances, you can have joy, but you've got to grasp it. You've got to come after it sometimes with violence to have the life that God's called for you to have, right? And so the man or woman of God is known by what they take hold of. Um, Paul said this in Philippians 3.12. Philippians 3.12. Not that I have obtained, already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul was pressing to take hold of knowing God, having an intimacy with him, as Christ said in John 17.3. He was pressing to fulfill his calling. He was God's workmanship. Each one of you have unfulfilled works that God has called for you to do. Things that he spoke over you before you were even born. Like Jeremiah, I called for you to be a prophet to the nations, but you've got to press. You've got to run with endurance. You've got to grasp with violence to be the man of God or the woman of God that God has called you to be. The man of God takes hold of it with violence. He presses into the kingdom of heaven, right, into the things that God has called him for. Are you taking hold of the life that is truly yours? 
the life that God has called you to. Here's the last one. The man of God is motivated by his knowledge of God. The man of God, the woman of God, is motivated by his, not, by his or her knowledge of God. 1 Timothy 6, 13 through 16 says this. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which God will bring about in his own time, God the blessed and the only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in an unapproachable light, who no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Paul challenges Timothy. He motivates him by the presence of God. I charge you in the sight of God and, and of the Father and the Son. But also the characteristics of God. He names God being blessed and immortal and the ruler. Um, essentially, he says this. Timothy, as you hear all these things I'm challenging you to, in fact, commanding you to do, it may feel too difficult, but you can do it. Why? Because God is great. God is with you. You see this throughout Scripture when God would motivate those he called, for instance, Moses, right? He calls Moses to set Israel free, and God, Moses says, hey, you got the wrong guy, Exodus 3. I'm slow of tongue. I don't speak well. I'm not a leader. And God says, who made the tongue? Who made the tongue? I'm going to empower you. Yes, it's difficult, but I'm there. This is who I am. I have power to empower you to speak. We see it with Gideon. Gideon, he calls him a mighty warrior and that he would lead Israel to fight against the Midianites. And Gideon says, not me. I am from the least tribe in Israel. And I'm least in my family. I'm, I'm like fungi. I'm the, la I'm the lowest of the low. You've got the wrong guy. But I'll be with you. I'll be with you. See, the man or woman of God is not confident because they, they're gifted speakers or because of their background or their pedigree. They're confident because of the presence of God and his character. He is the one that will see to it. He is the one that will help them flee their sins. He is the one that will help them pursue and even when they fall. He is the one that will help them fight the good fight of faith. He is the one that will help them take hold of eternal life. Yes, your calling is immense, but your God is greater. And he goes into this glory of God and he ends up with a doxology where he praises him. And this is true for us as well. We must remember that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. And God is able to do more than we could ask or imagine. What are some of God's attributes that Paul, character traits or attributes that Paul focuses on to motivate Timothy? There are nine of them. I'm going to try to run through these really quick, even though it's like half of my sermon. I don't want to spend that much time on them. And they're too difficult for me to fully teach. <laughs> Here's the first one. God is omniscient. God is omniscient. He says in verse 13, in the sight of God and of Christ. One of the things that should encourage the man or woman of God is the accountability of the fact that God sees and he knows and he's always watching. Timothy should be motivated by the fact that God sees and he knows. But also God is omnipotent. omnipotent. Verse 13, he gives life to everything. He says God is all-powerful. He's the creator, but also... Timothy, even if you die in the midst of this, God is able to raise you from the dead. Maybe he's saying that as he talks about Christ who made the good confession. He died and God rose him from the dead. He gives life to everything. You can do it because God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He gives life to everything. You can do it because God, I think, he's, I think he's demonstrating God's perseverance. He talks about Christ making the good confession before Pontius Pilate. No doubt as he looked at Christ who also went through a difficult time, who faithfully said, yes, I am the Messiah, I'm the king, and who was mocked and who was persecuted and put on the cross. He was called to look at Christ who first made the good confession before him, if he was called to persevere. The writer of Hebrews gives the same logic to persecuted Christians in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 2-3, fixing our eyes on Jesus, 
the pioneer and the perfecter of the faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and you will not lose heart. No doubt Paul is saying, think about Christ who made the good confession in front of Pontius Pilate. He encourages Timothy with God's second coming, or the parousia in Greek, the second coming of Christ. Verse 14, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. One of the great, greatest motivating factors for the man or woman of God is the fact that one day their master is coming, and they want to be faithful. They want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and this motivates them. 1 John, 1 John 3, 2-3, 1 John 3, 2-3 says this, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Listen to this. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. See, when the worldly believer doesn't want to think about Christ coming, doesn't pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done daily as part of their prayers as we're taught in the Lord's Prayer. When the worldly believer doesn't want to think about these things, the mature believer is motivated to get rid of sin, to flee from sin. He's motivated to fight the faith. He's motivated to pursue. Why? Because he has this view of the coming. His Lord is coming and he wants to be faithful. She wants to be faithful when he comes. The perusia, the appearing of our coming Lord. In verse 15, he calls the blessed God or the blessed God. So fifth, fifth thing is God's blessedness. The word bless, just like in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 3 through 10, um, the word bless can be translated happy. It means that even though even though there are earthquakes happening in Korea, even though there are Islam attacks happening around the world, God is always in a state of contentment. He always has a sense of deep-seated joy, not affected by the environment. And maybe Timothy, Paul tells Timothy this, or reminds Timothy, because this is where Timothy would get his blessedness from. Where he could be content, no matter if there's false teachers, no matter if he's being persecuted by Nero as the governments are persecuting Christians. Because your joy and my joy comes from not something inside me. It comes from the fact that God is the blessed God. Those who are in a right relationship with God, blessed are the poor in spirit. Because they have a right relationship with God, they can have joy no matter their circumstances. And so Timothy needed to realize that he is the the blessed God, the content God, the happy God, the fulfilled God. Here's the next one. The sixth character trait of God that he mentions is God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. The only ruler, the king of kings and the lord of lords. The word ruler can be translated the sovereign, the only sovereign. The word comes from a group of words in the Greek that mean power. Paul is saying God is totally in control. And this is one of the greatest characteristics in, of God that give the believer peace. That God is so in control that he works everything to the good of those who love the world, love the Lord. Ephesians 1.11, he works all things according to the purpose of his will. Everything conforms to God's purpose, like water in this bottle, earthquakes, tragedy. Everything somehow conforms to the purpose of God's will so the believer can have peace. The believer can trust God because God is the sovereign. Um, and he is the king of kings. He's the one that's over Nero, who's persecuting Christians. He's the one over all the, the bad presidents that we have, to, uh, options we have to elect as president in America. He is the king of kings. He is the one who's sovereign. So we're not shaken or worried. Why? Because we worship the sovereign one, the king of kings, and the lord of lords, right? We also have, he gives God's sovereignty. He says, alone is immortal. Immortal, the, the word literally means free from death. That he is the eternal one, right? Man and angels, there's a sense in which we never die because our spirit goes on for, forever and angels will live forever. But we have derived immortality. Immortality comes from God and we had a beginning, but God has always been. 
and God will always be. He is the immortal one. Timothy, your God is great. Number eight, he talks about God's holiness. God's holiness. Verse 16, he says he dwells in unapproachable light. This refers to the inherent glory of God. When Christ was transformed before his disciples, I believe it's in Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17 too. It talks about how Christ's face shine like the sun. Inherently, God is glorious. He's glorious and he's unapproachable by sin or anything evil. He is the transcendent one. There's nothing like him. Number nine, God's invisibility. Invisibility, verse 16, whom no one has seen or can see. God in his glory, no one has ever seen but Christ. He has revealed himself in what we call theophanies. Those are temporary appearances that we can discern him by the human, the human spirit or human senses. When he showed up to Israel in a cloud or in a fire by night and a cloud by day, God made appearances. But they could only see an appearance of God, not his full glory. God told Moses, you can see my back, but you can't see my face. We've only seen, he's invisible, and he, only, he can only be seen partially, in partially what he reveals. Um, Paul is saying to Timothy, yes, your call is immense, but God is greater. Now, um, Stephen Cole, in his sermon, he talked about how John Piper um, was preaching on the glory of God um, in his congregation. And how he wondered, would the glory of God, without applying it, without finding all these applications from it, would this meet the needs of his people? And so Steve Cole writes what John Piper wrote in his, uh, in his book. So I'm going to read what it says. John Piper, a pastor in Minneapolis, writes about a Sunday when he decided to preach on the greatness of God and his holiness and majesty as revealed in Isaiah's vision, Isaiah 6, in Isaiah 6. Normally, of course, Piper would have worked on applying such truth to his flock. But on that day, he felt led to make a test of whether the portrayal of the greatness of God in and of itself would meet the needs of the people. What he didn't realize was that not long before that Sunday, one of the young families in his church had discovered that their child was being sexually abused by a close relative. This family was there that Sunday and sat under his message. Piper reflects, I wonder how many advisors to us pastors today would have said, Pastor Piper, can't you see your people are hurting? Can't you come down out of the heavens and get practical? Don't you realize what kind of people sit in front of you on Sunday? Some weeks later, he learned the story. The husband took him to, a, to the side after a Sunday service and said, John, these have been the hardest months of our lives. Do you know what has gotten me through? The vision of the greatness of God's holiness that you gave me the first week of January. It has been the rock which we could stand on. One of the reasons that we are so weak and unable to fulfill the things that God has called us to do is because we really don't know God. We don't know his greatness and his splendor. We don't know his perfection and his perfect love for us. But if we did, if you imagine, if you knew how beautiful he, he was, then you would be willing to turn away from something so ugly as sin. If you knew how wonderful he is, then you wouldn't live for something so tiny in your life other than God's glory. If we knew how perfect and wonderful he was, then we could live the life that God had called us to live. No doubt many of us live sub-Christian lives, sub-Christian lives in the sense that we're missing God's best because we really don't know. We're not really knowing the eternal life that God has given us. No doubt the man of God, just like with Paul, he battles this with his own heart, focusing on God's glory, but also he continually mentions God's sovereignty, God's love when he ministers to others. Why? Because that's their greatest need. Their greatest need is to know God and his splendor and his glory. In this passage, Paul contrasts the false teachers who were men of this world with Timothy, who was a man who was owned by God. And he gives characteristics of the man or woman of God, someone mature in the faith. The man of God flees from sin, constantly fl um, fleeing. 
because he doesn't, doesn't want to go back. He knows what it is to fall and be trapped. And he's constantly, he's a fugitive, a holy fugitive. She's a holy fugitive. The man of God pursues godly character, endurance. Yeah, you may be going through a hard time, but the man of God realized, the woman of God, God is helping me persevere. He's developing this in my life. He's developing love in my life by giving me a roommate that gets on my nerves or a boss that's difficult. He's developing, and I need to pursue this love. Forgiving. Love doesn't hold the record of wrongs. The man of God fights for the faith, the doctrines that God has given us. He fights in his mind, and he fights for those that he ministers to. The man of God takes hold of eternal life. He grasps it with violence for his peace, for his joy, for knowing God. He's violent in his pursuit of going after God. The man of God is motivated. The woman of God is motivated by the knowledge of God. 